The idea here is really to talk about diplomacy uh, in the digital age more than uh, uh, digital diplomacy. Um, and I'm going to basically look at the new means, new challenges. Is there a new substance? Um, the We'll start with a sort of the um, 101 on diplomacy. What is diplomacy and what is diplomacy in the digital uh, age? Then we're going uh, uh, to look at the new means and I'm going to focus on the evolution of embassies, ambassadors and uh, um, diplomatic dispatches. Let me be super clear from the start that um, this is uh, um, going to be a very idiosyncratic uh, set of examples so that I will use just to inspire you more than bore you to death with the range of uh, data. Uh, the idea being that you see my direction of travel rather than study a graph uh, in the, uh, detail. And then I, uh, I'm going to start a bit of a reflection on the new time space of diplomacy and what are the challenges, the choices, the difficult choices that diplomacy is facing at the moment uh, before concluding with a question uh, and a preliminary uh, answer uh, in terms of whether this amounts to a sort of new post-human diplomacy uh, as I uh, would like to um, explore. So let me get started uh, with a sort of a um, definition of diplomacy, uh, which, you know, uh, we can start from, again, a sort of a, a nice way to put it, that is uh, that diplomacy started when the first human societies decided that it was better to hear a message than to eat the messenger. Uh, which is, you know, a pretty basic definition, but at the same time does give the idea that there are societies in the plural um, and there is no violence, no eating of the messenger, and rather instead listening to the message, so there is a message. Uh, to put it in more academic terms, we can say that diplomacy is essentially a communicative practice designed to manage relations between states. And it's made mm, functions, our negotiations, information gathering and representation uh, in relation to enemies as well as to uh, friends. So it's not just about the peaceful means, which is a bit of a sort of a superficial view of uh, uh, diplomacy, but it is also and especially about the communication. Clear enough, when uh, uh, the digital age and the incredible transformations uh, that digital technologies are bringing to communication, big changes are in the offing. It's not just about using digital means. It's more than that. It's a sort of a hybrid, as, uh, for instance, Biola and Manor uh, defined it. It is sort of a, an intimate entanglement of uh, um, uh, diplomacy with uh, digital uh, technologies. Uh, something that, for instance, uh, Adler Nissel and Egeling define as blended diplomacy. This sort of really blurring of the lines between the physical and uh, the uh, virtual. Um, how does it happen? It happens obviously through means, uh, through digital means, and to name those that we are all familiar with, Zoom, Twitter, um, email, um, WhatsApp messages. Uh, it also happens about digital issues, and this is uh, about cybersecurity, about uh, um, digital sovereignty. Uh, you open the newspaper and you find a negotiation about uh, digitally, uh, digital related issues all the time. Um, it is also happening in a digitally saturated environment, which means uh, that uh, uh, it happens, uh, for instance, in a digital environment where we're talking about chip wars, uh, where everyone is interested in artificial intelligence, uh, trying out artificial intelligence, and where artificial intelligence is profoundly changing uh, working environment and personal spaces uh, at the same time. So, let me start with uh, the sort of the inspiring examples that I promised uh, uh, at the beginning. And let me start uh, with the evolution of uh, embassies. Uh, this is the classical embassy. Uh, 
uh, something that we can all uh, relate to, the brick and mortar uh, embassy, in this case, uh, the Swedish embassy in uh, Tallinn, uh, Estonia, uh, projects this image of solid, peaceful relations, a flag in front, uh, I mean, a uh, postcard uh, case study of an embassy. This is a bit of a more modern take, the Swedish embassy in uh, Washington. Prize-winning architecture, trying to project uh, this idea of uh, Scandinavian architecture uh, being super modern, sleek, functional. Again, projecting an image of solidity uh, and presence with the flag uh, in front. This is instead the Swedish embassy on Second Life which is uh, a uh, virtual reality fantasy world. Um, and it is a, a, a intentionally uh, created to mirror the, wish the Washington embassy. It's exactly the same. Um, so the idea is to recreate the uh, Swedish embassy in Washington in a virtual world. To do what, you might think, you know, why on earth uh, um, uh, parachuting uh, uh, an embassy in a fantasy world uh, to promote Sweden. Uh, well, so uh, courses of Swedish language, uh, Swedish festivals, uh, information about Sweden, uh, information about visas um, for people who are interested in going to Sweden. This was uh, the very first uh, virtual embassy that was opened uh, in a uh, virtual uh, environment. Um, it attracted a bit of controversy at the time. Uh, the big question here uh, was, do we need embassies in virtual worlds? We don't have borders uh, in virtual worlds. Why do we need uh, embassies to manage those uh, uh, relations? But at the same time, it, it was quite successful. A number of people visited, met uh, Swedes, met Swedes uh, uh, in the Swedish uh, embassy in Second Life. It was an experiment that was brought to an end in 2013, but with the uh, you know, advancement of META, uh, what we have seen is other countries you know, thinking to go uh, along the same path. Uh, like, for instance, uh, uh, Barbados announced that it's going to open uh, a, a virtual embassy in 2021. Meta, as we all know, is this thing that might happen soon, is happening. We're not sure when precisely it's going to happen, uh, but the more it happens, the more we will see this coming uh, to the front. And it is uh, uh, interesting to see, you know, how the, um, we start with brick and mortar and we end up uh, in a totally digital environment composed of zero one. This is another one, uh, in, in another interesting one, um, data embassies and digital twin. This is prompted uh, by existential threats, um, which are uh, endangering uh, digital services that states offer to their own uh, citizens, uh, and therefore they uh, create the, the need to protect this data. Um, in uh, embassies abroad or with uh, um, dedicated uh, data embassies. Uh, we're all familiar with the um, concept of a data uh, server centre, uh, where the, the, uh, our data is uh, hosted uh, behind, um, you know, it's obviously impossible to uh, visit uh, confidential spaces, uh, and so I've chosen sort of a neutral picture here. But the story is that, um, uh, uh, for instance, Estonia has invested very heavily uh, on this. E-Estonia is part of the Estonian brand. Uh, and um, uh, as they say, you can uh, do almost everything online in Estonia, uh, apart from getting uh, married and divorced. Uh, so uh, they uh, the problem uh, was uh, 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 raised that uh, with the big cyber attacks uh, uh, that uh, Estonia faced uh, uh, starting from 2007, how are they to protect their uh, data? One possibility was at first to literally carry it into embassies, but then they decided to open a data embassy in Luxembourg, uh, which is sort of a totally separated uh, thing. 
It might, again, this is meant to inspire you, but to make you understand how this can actually uh, happen in a different context, think also of Ukraine. Uh, when Ukraine uh, was invaded, it had to transfer its data very quickly uh, because it, it risked uh, otherwise a sort of a digital uh, extinction. And therefore, thanks to, uh, by um, using uh, Microsoft <coughs> and Amazon, it transferred all the data of its ministries, of its uh, um, land registry, universities, uh, all the important data was uh, uh, transferred uh, abroad. Um, in a way, here we're talking about digital twins. We're all familiar with the concept that uh, uh, in order to have business continuity, you need to ha make sure that data can be accessible in difficult and challenging uh, situations. In the case of uh, uh, a, a state, this means a sort of a data embassy or uh, alike. What can this lead to? The web page, the importance of the web page. This is the US uh, um, Embassy to Canada projecting uh, uh, an image of solid peaceful relations uh, in a digital uh, environment. This is uh, the US Embassy in Afghanistan. Uh, as you might know, uh, the US obviously um, abandoned, left uh, the uh, US uh, embassy in Kabul, but the web page is still there uh, and it's giving information about where to find uh, um, other information, how it's working, uh, etc. And this is the US virtual embassy to Iran. Um, the US does not work, with, does not recognize the Iranian government, but it has a web page which is very similar to the others um, and with the aim to re reach Iranian uh, citizens. And again, you see how uh, the digital environment, the virtual environment, brings you to blur the line between what exists, what doesn't exist in physical reality, what is recognized and what is not uh, recognized by a state. Here I will be uh, quicker, but it's interesting to see that, for instance, uh, Tuvalu, a small island in the Pacific, which is facing an existential threat with the uh, rising levels of the sea, is planning to have a virtual um, version of itself uh, in order to protect its own identity. Um, this is in instead it's a uh, virtual space for buying stuff promoted by Italy. This is uh, um, an image um, inspiring uh, the Aboriginal Indigenous community of uh, Australia who wants to have uh, a virtual recognition by opening a virtual embassy. All examples meant to draw you uh, in the direction of imagining how embassies are evolving. Obviously, the vast majority of embassies are uh, made of brick and mortar, but the, uh, all of them have a web page. And somehow, the web page is more important than the brick and mortar, uh, because that's where all the information for accessing the brick and mortar is, um, are kept. Um, and the digital slash virtual uh, version is becoming more relevant uh, as we speak. It'll be much faster on the evolution of, uh, for instance, ambassadors. Uh, we have embassies, we have ambassadors physically representing uh, states. Um, since 2017, there is a, a very uh, visible trend towards uh, the appointment of tech ambassadors or digital ambassadors. This was uh, our pictures of the Danish, Estonian and French uh, digital ambassadors at a cyber and tech retreat in San Francisco a couple of weeks ago. Um, Silicon Valley being the place where a lot of them are posted or tend to uh, gravitate around. Again, it's interesting to see the states feel the need to appoint a state representative to a world that doesn't physically exist, but is becoming more and more uh, relevant, important for their own uh, functioning. Um, they have a 
broad remit to uh, negotiate with the tech companies uh, to be uh, top of the uh, league in terms of digital uh, issues. And the evolution of diplomatic dispatches, where uh, when we talk about diplomatic dispatches, we all imagine a sort of a little uh, letter coming in um, uh, from uh, a faraway place uh, describing the latest uh, um, uh, evolution in a faraway remote uh, place. This instead is uh, the Irish ambassador at the UN being uh, briefed uh, about uh, um, developments uh, in Guatemala. Um, the future of um, uh, diplomatic dispatches includes, uh, it's not just, uh, but it's a sort of a virtual um, reality or a sort of a mix of digital uh, and physical reality uh, representing um, visually uh, what a uh, diplomatic dispatch used to do. So where does that leave us? Uh, let's talk about the consequences of all these um, interesting examples, uh, at least interesting for me, examples of uh, how diplomacy works in the digital age. Um, the big consequences we can measure in terms of time and space. In terms of time, it is clear that there is a quickening of the tempo. Uh, talking to diplomats, they all feel under pressure. We feel it, you know, in our daily work that, you know, we're constantly running after things and af with the, an increasing number of emails uh, that lie and read in our uh, mailbox. Uh, diplomats feel this uh, uh, every single time and every single uh, day. And this uh, has the consequence that they have much less time to respond. Uh, so, for instance, this uh, was clear during the uh, Ukrainian invasion that put a terrible uh, pressure on diplomats to try to understand what exactly uh, was, was going on. Very often, uh, we see it also with politicians, that they, have, they don't have the time to be debriefed by diplomats before putting up a position. And always in, in terms of tempo, uh, now uh, diplomacy works 24-7, 365 days uh, per year. Uh, so much time uh, that uh, it needs to go into following uh, international events that, um, that uh, diplomats are used to check uh, their phone during the private time all the time. What about the, the space dimension? Well, yes, there is a flattening of geography so that um, it, there is no more the distance of the um, faraway places. There is also new slash old digital devices are emerging in terms of age so that we have, are in a funny situation where uh, diplomats uh, in the positions of power do not belong to the digitally native uh, situation. We have a, a, a gender gap where women potentially could be helped to participate more to the diplomatic processes, but often end up in fact being on the wrong side of the spectrum. Sorry. And um, we have an increasing uh, uh, divide between global north and global south, which means that the priorities of the global south uh, do not get heard as much as uh, priorities in the global north. So let me finish. Does this all does all this mean that we are in a trans have transition to a post-human diplomatic world? Um, just to be on the same side, post-humanity refers to this a seamless articulation of human beings with intelligent um, machines and other material presences of this world. And if you're interested, you can follow up on Hale's and Bredotti's work. Um, in a way, we are all in a tension between a human and post-human uh, condition. Uh, and this can be constraining, you know, you might think that we're losing control, but uh, it can also be liberating, uh, you know, to move away from a, a, an anthropocentric uh, version of international politics uh, to include instead uh, different subjects from technology to the environment, for instance. And it is, in a way, uh, the, uh, in the evidence that despite being a conservative 
art, diplomacy is more and more relying on a number of uh, post-human practices, uh, as I have uh, uh, touched upon uh, in this uh, presentation. And let me finish by saying that we are a bit of a sort of a, at a watershed moment with the arrival of artificial intelligence in the way that it is uh, arriving. Um, the next couple of years will really be crucial in defining the new normal for diplomacy in the digital age. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Start by asking you, you mentioned this is research in progress. What's, what's next for the project? Mm. At the moment, I am uh, focusing very much on the tech ambassadors. I'm fascinated by the fact that they have this uh, mandate to a land that doesn't exist. Uh, and while ambassadors at large have always existed in terms of, you know, um, for gender issues, or for human rights, etc., uh, there is a sort of a a very clear drive towards uh, tech ambassadors being uh, the new normal uh, for uh, modern countries. So they're becoming a sign uh, of uh, being uh, uh, top dogs uh, if you have a tech ambassador. Um, despite the fact that it might uh, just be a sort of a consul general in San Francisco that is given the extra responsibility to tackle uh, technological stuff in the, in the Silicon Valley. Uh, but we see, for instance, in the UK, uh, the UK has uh, published this sort of a technology strategy that includes uh, um, training for all its diplomats to become tech ambassadors de, de facto. Uh, and therefore, you know, whoever is aiming to be uh, a diplomat nowadays needs to develop this uh, set of skills, which is not just about tweeting or being uh, able to communicate in, uh, uh, through social media, but also to understand the very profound uh, and uh, challenging um, transformations that we are witnessing. Um, thank you very much for this presentation. I wanted to ask you what you felt about, because obviously often informal diplomacy and diplomatic relations has been very important. And if meetings, for example, between diplomats or in these different arenas are now happening, you know, virtually on, in online spaces through screens, do you think that is something that you think will have a considerable impact, given that the sort of informal, um, sort of behind doors uh, human nature is there? And I also wanted to ask, because um, of course often we've heard that body language is very important in a kind of diplomacy. And I wondered whether you thought that that's something which will now kind of lose its salience with things being done increasingly online through screens, or if maybe it will be kind of transcended by sort of different form of sort of e-language or e- or digital etiquette somehow. Yes. No, definitely. Uh, I mean, in fact, the two things are related because the bodily language tends to happen more in, in, in the informal uh, settings and situations, um, which are absolutely central to uh, diplomacy. Um, we do see a, a sort of an e-body language being tra um, developed. Uh, WhatsApp groups are very, very important um, and they are becoming a, a, the, the new informal way uh, to communicate, uh, including with emojis, uh, which, uh, you know, it's a, a way to try to transpose uh, the body language or the, the emotional aspect, the affective aspect of uh, uh, diplomacy in uh, uh, a digital uh, environment. At the same time, it's interesting to see that um, the, um, the, the, the uh, embodiment of diplomacy uh, needs to find some specific settings where it just stays like that. Um, because, for instance, uh, uh, and a very interesting observation that uh, a diplomat told me, for instance, is that in the digital environment and in the written uh, environment, it's much more difficult to hear the silences. So the sort of the uh, hesitations, uh, the, um, which you might get in a Zoom uh, or uh, in a phone call, but the, but the non-said, the non-verbal, uh, risks uh, to be uh, impossible to translate in a zero-one language. Uh, and therefore, that space 
for the silences, for the hesitations, uh, I think, is, uh, uh, for the ambiguities that diplomacy need, uh, tackles, I think that that's quite uh, important to maintain. Uh, we do see that, you know, we still see some extreme uh, uh, loads of bilateral uh, meetings and uh, um, diplomats jetting uh, around the world so that, that they still keep up their physical presence uh, in all this. But it's interesting to see how uh, the physical presence might be reduced to uh, a couple of hours uh, and around it <laughs> There is a whole world of WhatsApping, emailing, uh, Zooming, uh, um, consulting hypertext, uh, you know, that with the, with links and networks, uh, so that the, uh, the the physical presence is just one part in a bigger uh, picture. I'm curious whether that with embassies going virtual, will that change the basic services that embassies deliver to to the citizens living in the foreign countries? Or there's like not much difference, just being more convenient, convenient to the citizens who live there. Uh, well, the convenience is up to, to you to <laughs> judge, but uh, it is certainly uh, interesting to see that, for instance, uh, uh, Canada has moved its consular services totally online, um, and uh, it's not supervised either. Uh, so you apply for a visa through a website uh, and uh, you might have a, a, an, an interview through Zoom if you're uh, really uh, lucky or unlucky. Uh, but uh, the, 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 the digital, the digitalization of consular services, uh, it's moving in this direction so that fewer and fewer people will actually have to enter an embassy uh, queuing to get uh, uh, a visa. Is this more or less convenient? In a way, if everything goes well, it is very convenient. Uh, if things don't go well, then it, it becomes very inconvenient because you, but in order to appeal and to uh, go around that system, uh, it's much more clunky. <coughs> Sorry if this is kind of ignorant, but I'm curious about the, the costs and the resources associated with setting up this digital infrastructure to facilitate diplomacy because I can see situations in which some countries can afford to set this up and be present in this, and some countries can't, you know, influencing different power dynamics and how able they are to engage in this diplomacy. So could you speak more to that? Absolutely. Yeah, no, very good question. I mean, uh, um, good question indeed. The, uh, part of that is uh, reflected in the Global North, Global South uh, digital divide, uh, where countries of the Global South struggle. Uh, for a number of reasons, uh, from uh, digital sovereignty of their own data uh, to the possibility to put up facilities that are very costly uh, and that are generally placed in the Global North. Uh, so that they are not just uh, not available, but when they are available, they are placed elsewhere uh, and digital regulations uh, apply in a way that is not favourable to the Global South. Uh, so the thing is, that explains also why somehow you see a rush at the moment, uh, because once uh, there we have a new equilibrium, uh, then we will have winners and losers. Um, uh, one aspect that uh, you know touches upon uh, your question is also the fact that um, often we talk about di the digital age, digital environment as if they have no cost, no material basis, uh, but uh, it's just much more hidden. Um, and so it does pay off to follow the uh, wire <laughs> and see precisely where it is located, what kind of regulations apply, uh, what kind of costs, because that brings you to a better uh, focus on the type of issues that you're mentioning here. Take final questions. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, it's been fantastic. My question is in regards to the security that comes with this transition. And I'm just curious as to whether you're finding that the post-human diplomacy is main, like it's maintained within the, the lower level or medium level of priority um, issues that are going on with diplomacy. Because I do understand that you know, having a face-to-face uh, -face is much more important mm. for security issues, whereas when you're having a conversation on a computer mm. with somebody on a very high level issue, that has its own very different issues. I'm curious as to whether you're finding that it is staying at that level of like where they're not really having that at the high level, and then is there a push maybe to have that, you know, where 
present Biden is having a conversation with Prime Minister Albanese in uh, Australia or something like that. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's a very good point because indeed another, you know, together with that informal element, another, you know, issues that is going to stay is the super confidential stuff that uh, is done, uh, you know, in the open, uh, in the middle of a field or <laughs> far away from um, places where it can be picked up. This has always been the case in a way, if we go back to the time of uh, uh, the Soviet Union, you know, it, it was renowned that the only safe conversation <laughs> was in the middle of the street. Um, so we, we are again in that type of environment where, um, you know, face to face, away from uh, uh, digital sources uh, would help. Um, there, there is a lot, uh, again, of um, uh, digital north, digital south stuff here, so that the digital north uh, uh, is uh, uh, much better at protecting uh, its own uh, uh, data. Um, it is also a matter of trust, ultimately, in the system, because, you know, even if you go face to face, you know, that doesn't mean that the document is not leaked. Um, and so we see, for instance, in, in terms of uh, uh, multilateral environments where the trust is eroding at the margins or at the UN most uh, uh, explosively, uh, you know, then it doesn't really matter because, you know, if there is no trust, it doesn't matter if it is digital or in person um, in terms of the confidentiality. It matters in terms of uh, the informal relationship uh, that you might develop uh, at the uh, edges. Um, but uh, indeed, that's another big, big issue uh, on the table. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, as I mentioned, this will be recorded and up online, so yeah, I really appreciate your time today. Thank you for your questions. <laughs> and yeah, this was the last of the series. We should be back in the autumn, but we do have a special hot off the press printed copy of our online research magazine. Highlights.